You're listening to a Skewed Orbit original podcast. Hey friends, welcome back to Highly Unlikely. I'm your host, Alex Getlin, and this is the show where I get my friends high and teach them about a subject that is so bizarre. It seems highly unlikely, but it is 100% true. Now, my guest today is my good friend, Anthony Amorello. He's a hilarious stand-up comedian, and this episode, we're going to learn about the Russian mafia. Oh, yeah, you're right. I love that. So, Anthony, before we start, I ask everybody this. You're a pretty frequent weed smoker, you would say, right? Yeah. I've had a variety. Some people are real heavy weed smokers. Some are super lightweights. Mm. But um, it's part of your daily diet. I don't know. Like, how often would yeah. you say? Yeah. Uh, recently I just took like, uh, a month break yeah. for like the first time in maybe eight years. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I probably smoke at least three to four times a day. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dude, yeah. I'm like, after my son goes to, I'm a dad, by the yeah, way, I think, a, but most of the listeners dad. probably know that, but like, so I'm, I've got the dad smoke schedule. What that means is when my son has gone to bed and I'm done working for the day, and my wife is down to be lead parent because you need to have somebody on call in case there's an emergency or whatever. And she's like, yeah, 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 it's fine. Then I go on my porch and I smoke a joint. That's like a couple times a week. Four, I don't know the last time I did four in a day. Holy shit, dude. Yeah, I mean, what else am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm just I love uh, it. smoking weed, writing jokes. Okay, so Anthony, what do you know about the Russian mafia? Nothing. Literally nothing. Yeah. No. Nothing other than the Yamashino Burt Kreischer story. That's it. Yeah. Okay. So Burt, Burt yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't, we don't have anything to do with that. But uh, you know anything yeah. about the, the Italian mafia? Like the main yeah. mafia people know? Yeah. I didn't want to do Italian mafia because I feel like you are I Italian. Pre- I appreciate that. You kind of like two on the nose. Yeah. 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 But interestingly, there's a lot of crossover with the Italian mafia, and, the Italian American mafia, and not all of the Russian mafia worldwide, but the Russian American mafia. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Some uh, interesting crossover there, how there were some rivalries, some mutual benefit stuff. But to start first, just give you some background. Oh, you have a question? No, I just like that's a, a great rivalry. Like like yeah. Yankees, Red Sox type. Yeah, yeah, the Russians right. and the Italians. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, they act well, I'll, we'll get to that towards the end of the episode. Because before we can talk about the Russian American mafia, we need to talk about the origins of the mafia um, altogether, the Russian mafia from Russia, right? How it started before they, it made sure. it over here. And, you know, being a mafia, all the classics they're involved with, extortion, art theft, money laundering, contract killings, arms dealings, human trafficking, drug trafficking. Interestingly, they also are known for uranium smuggling, which is used for nuclear stuff. That yeah. checks out. Yeah. That, I feel like that was the least surprising <laughs> thing on that list. But like, I feel like that's very specific. Like, I don't hear about the cartels smuggling uranium. You know what I mean? It's a very Russian. Yeah, that's not a cartel thing. Yeah. That's, a, that's a Russian-ass thing. Yeah. But the Russian mafia is known <laughs> as Bratva. There's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to pronounce certain Russian words that I wrote down through this. But it literally means... I'm not. <laughs> yeah. But it literally means brotherhood. So when you say bratva, it's like that's what's kind of... Similar to like how someone would say la cosa nostra, I believe is... Right? Yeah. Here's the big difference between um, the Russian mafia versus like the Yakuza or the Italian-American mafia. It's a lot more of like disconnected sub-gangs. There's not one key guy at the head of when it starts. Now, we'll get later to some of the current leaders, but in the earliest origins, basically, the Russian mafia was a response to the brutal communist uh, living situation that the citizens of Russia had during the 20s, 30s. how most mobs start. Yeah, right. So before that, we gotta go back to pre-1917. What is today Russia, that whole part of the world, was run by czars, kings, basically. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, kings don't have a great track record at being popular with their um, people that they rule over over, why over would time. They, why would they want to be, you know? <laughs> yeah. 1917, the Bolshevik Revolution happens. They overthrow the czars, kill all those people. A handful of, uh, you know, political operatives take power. Basically, they're like, we live under this brutal czar. We're going to have communism. We're going to sort it out for everybody. It's going to be great. Trust us. Sounds like a plan with no Sounds way. Sounds like a government. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. No way that it could go wrong, right? So during this time, um, as you can imagine, it was pretty uh, crazy, the rules they had for everybody living under communist Russia, and people are getting arrested left and right. Um, you're getting arrested for things as simple as like making jokes about the government, that your you know, neighbors think that you're not a good enough communist party member. So it's not just like your normal kind of criminals that are going 
to jail. You know what I mean? It's just like everybody. Which is why their mob is a little, is more badass. Because oh, yeah. like, like they're smuggling uranium. But yeah, <laughs> they're yeah. not allowed to tell jokes. Like right, that's, right, right. That's brutal. So Stalin's in power and he opens these gulags. And the gulags are basically, um, there's about 18 million people that get forced into the labor camps of the gulags. To put that in perspective, there's about 2 million people incarcerated in America right now. Yeah, that's... 18 million people, right? That Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like two and a half LAs. Like that's you could wild. have got... Yeah, like basically you could get up to like 25 years for making a joke about Stalin. Uh, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so it's kind of a crazy environment. So from that, what happens is there's all these gangs that... I mean, every prison has gangs, but these are kind of... Um, their big thing is they're so hyper against the government of Russia. Like their main thing is like... They don't look at themselves in maybe how some criminal operatives do. It's like, yeah, we chose like a criminal life because we, we're going to make more money selling cocaine than I could being like a regular schmo in an auto body shop or something. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's yeah. a lot more like, oh, we are gov- we are um, being ruled over by like villainous persecutors. You have to be a criminal. Like being a criminal is almost like more patriotic. Does that make sense? I'm kind of yeah. breaking this down. Yeah. Okay. It's um, like a... a, a Robin Hood if he had a gang. That's exactly what it's like. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Right. Yeah, yeah. So um, while there's all these guys in prison and, you know, they're kind of so mad at the government, they're you're organizing, they're collecting, they're sort of, you know, really sort of building their own um, governments within each other, how to govern each other. I'll get back more to the Gulag situation in a second, but it give you some context of, of what this meant. So the USSR, which was the, you know, former Soviet Union, it wasn't, um, it, was, it was a semi-diverse place in the sense like it wasn't just people that are like ethnic Russians. You had all kinds of like subculture groups of Eastern Europe that would end up in there. The, one of the big differences between the Russian mafia and like the Italian American mafia, you got to be purebred Italian. And I think for a while it was even purebred Sicilian to be, a, to be in the mafia. Yeah. Not the case. Actually, in this context, the Russian mafia was pretty progressive. You didn't have to be any specific ethnicity. You just had to hate the government. You just had to never have worked. I love that. Yeah, you know? I love so, that. So actually, this comes later, but a lot of Armenians ended up either directly in the Russian mafia or like very closely tied. I was uh, I was thinking about that because I know the Russians run a lot of drugs through Armenian borders. Mm-hmm. And yep. uh, the Armenians, and like even here, the there's an Armenian gang called Armenian Power, but they're just run by Russians. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll talk about AP-13 in a little bit. Yeah, that's what they're called. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that's their yeah. like street code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's wild how like Russia's government is supposed to take care of Armenia mm-hmm. and they don't, but their mobs take care of right. Armenians. So that's like, basically what it was like, dude. So the thing is like, so wild. it's so funny because there was no, my, my, the sense I got from my research, they didn't really have the sense of like ethnic pride for their group because they hated their, the people who would like their government so much. It was like, yeah, it just, whatever, dude, you could be from like any other like region over here, just help us like earn a living and fuck these guys, you know, fuck these communists. I love that. Okay. Um, in fact, the term that was used for like their organization was known as Vori V Z- Zakon, I believe. It literally means a thief in the law. So it's basically, that was like the, that's the literal translation of it. So while they're in prison, they made this 18 point code of rules. Now these rules don't really apply in the sense of like the Russian mafia today. This was very specifically as they were building up, okay. the, you know, cause not all the people in the gulags were in, you know, the, right. the Russian mafia system. Right. You had it's to, a new sensation. Yeah. Like K-pop. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> so here were the 18 <laughs> points that were key. Okay. Um, number one, your crime family is your real family. Seems yeah. accurate. Classic. Right? Okay. Classic mob rule. You cannot have a wife or kids. Girlfriends are okay. No wives or kids. This is getting pretty Catholic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, absolutely no quote unquote legit work, which basically means like if you're working in hand with the government in any capacity, you're out, dude. You got to be a thief. I can okay? be. I can get up behind that. All right. Four. Number four. You have to help other thieves. So th- the thievery is designed to help each other. It's very interesting. No thief left behind. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. kind of like your Robin Hood thing, right? Um, number five through 10 are kind of confusing how they're like, cause it's like translations, but basically it's just the code of like no snitching, but not even just no snitching, like getting someone in trouble. Like don't even like help the government with information. Like even if someone's not going to get necessarily 
like thrown in the gulag. If the, if the government just like needs you to do something to help mm. them, you can't do that. Complete cold shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, like no text back. Yeah. No, yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. Um, and then also they had their own system of courts to make like judgments and rulings. Whatever is decided, you follow that. How can do you have more information on that? What was that court like? Basically, the elders, the higher ups, the shot callers of the gangs would, you know, hear disputes and make a ruling. And in the ruling, st- you had to follow the ruling. That's so wild. Yeah. That's like. But they, again, they were <laughs> like, they, it wasn't just a gang culture. It was a culture that grew out of like. They're just trying to be a government to yeah. themselves. They're trying to have a decent life. And their only option is brutal communism where people are like starving to death. That's so wild. One day you're you're. Uh, stealing uranium the next day you're passing judgment on yeah. <laughs> like that's so that's what <laughs> yeah the uranium came later but I get what you're saying yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well another thing too I forgot to mention at the top partly another reason why they were arresting so many people and throwing them in the gulags is they were labor camps and Russia was trying to flex like communism is so great we're the best you know because after World War II it was basically the USSR and America who had control and it was like the capitalists versus the communists so Stalin really wanted to show the world that Communism was the future, and you need people to work. Shocker, when people are kind of forced into a situation where, you know, um, under a communist government, they don't really want to work very hard. So what do you do? You throw them in the gulag, and you make them be part of a labor camp. So there was, you know what I'm saying? It was just adding to that. I know the gulag or gulag, however you say it, is like a terrible place, but it sounds so fun. Oh, okay. <laughs> like it does. I think it is gulag, actually. Yeah, it just it sounds like a fun, like it would be the name of something fun, but in <laughs> yeah, reality. Um, I get what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the opposite of fun, but the name is lends to as far as Russian goes, like yeah. Ru- Russian language, like For sure. Gulag, gulag's their most fun word. Um, you also have to know Fenya, which is like Russian slang. Like ba- it's basically like th- thief code words. You know what I'm saying? So it was like very important. You had to like know that language. You had to know how to speak the talk. These I think are funny. Okay, um, you do not gamble more than you can pay off. I guess they must have been degenerate gamblers. <laughs> that was like really important. Just uh, just one guy went too far one yeah. time, and they're like, "That's it, fucking." You're out. Dude. Yeah, then. You had to teach the younger ones, so it was important to like pass the lessons on to the people below you Um, have informants. There wasn't a lot of explanation of what that meant specifically. Um, This one is my favorite. Handle your alcohol. Do not be a sloppy drunk. (laughs) That's, uh, that's actually a solid ass rule. Yeah. Right. Uh, But this like also when you add the like no women, no, like no family, this sounds worse. No, you can have a girlfriend though. You just can't have anyone that you're like, Basically, you have to be loyal to the crime family. You can't have another family that might take you. That's what I think where it comes from. In the All last right. couple, uh, you can have net, like no snitching in addition to that, but like you couldn't have even worked with the government before this. So if you worked with the government, like if you were kind what? of like, yeah, seems like they're leaving out a lot of people. Also, you could never have served in the military. <laughs> I'm guessing they had made what. Ex- but again, remember because then you were helping the government. You were helping the Communist Party. Yeah, but what if you don't? Hey, man, I didn't make the rules. I'm just reading them to you. And the last one is you have to honor your word to other thieves. I don't know so why fun. I'm getting mad as if this is, like, my my option. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Were you in the, the Soviet military? No, no, but that just seems like a really bad rule for a mob. Like, it seems like you would want some military people. Yeah. If, if they were truly for your cause. You I know get what, what you're mean? saying. I think it's just they felt they couldn't trust them. Well, this is where it really kicked kicked off crazy. Okay. okay. So Stalin's got all these people locked up. He's in World War II, and he's like, I need to replenish my front lines. So he tells a bunch of the people in the gulags, hey, if you go fight in the war, I'll either like reduce your sentence or just pardon you outright. So the thieves are like, hey, fuck that. No, we are loyal to our thievery. We're not going to go fight for Stalin. But a lot of people did. Yeah. Because they, so then <laughs> this is what came into effect from 1945 to 1953. It was known. It was literally called the Bitch Wars. I'm not <laughs> making that up. Okay. So, okay. so suka is the Russian word for bitch. Anybody who defected, or like, def- like it's um, got some snap to signed it. up to the fight in the military. They were labeled a suka, basically. They were called a bitch. It doesn't have quite the same <laughs> translation as like in America, but it is funny to me that like in multiple language, a, specifically a female dog is a is a slang, like a curse slang. I don't know where that comes from. 
Yeah. I have to research the etymology of that. I don't know. Mm, I don't know. But either way, so, okay. So then a lot of the suka who, when they were done fighting, they still had to go back to the gulags. It was reduced sentences, but they still had to go back. So then it was like a total war between, like, let's say, for example, Stalin shaved off five years, but they still had to do the other five or something. So yeah, what? yeah, it seems like I don't, I don't know. I would have fucking left, dude. Yeah. You know, what I mean? for like, sure. Like in the middle of the war, it, just kind of like take your helmet off. Yeah, it, <laughs> look at the start. I've never been in a war zone. I have to think it's not quite that easy. But what year is this? It's World War Two. It's so it's like yeah, yeah, okay. 1944, 43. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not like they got heat seeking missiles. <laughs> I think sure. you, I think you could sneak off at fucking. All right. Yeah, you just can go like I guess. Take it in France. Try and restart your life in France. Yeah. Way better than going back and either having to be a part of this communist bullshit or right. or this fucking mob. It's a good point. Yeah. So anyway, so then when they went to prison, back to prison, they were, you know, really targeted by the, the thieves who stayed in prison. Mm -hmm. so they started working for the guards. And basically the guards were using these guys. And then... Even though it got crazy violent, there's like records showed that like they let it continue because they thought it was an easy way to weed out criminals. And the government was like, well, if they just kill each other. You know, we don't have to deal with it. You know what? I like that. Yeah. I think let that's uh, just let them, um, <laughs> let them burn out. So in 1953, <laughs> eight million criminals get uh, released from the labor camps. They're starting to enter back into society, right? So... Hey, is there a reason? Stalin died in 53, and then mm -hmm. 8 million were released, but then by 1960, it was just disbanded altogether by the next guy. Oh, that was the 8 million comedians that got locked up for telling <laughs> jokes yeah, about right. Stalin. Right, okay. There was no Twitter, and everybody just kept getting had, bro. So then, <laughs> right, yeah. So then the government, and while this is happening, let me give some more context. While this is happening, there are still bootleggers bringing in black market goods into Russia, right? Like communism didn't really work, like shocker, people yeah. are smuggling in stuff. Those guys are making a killing. And as more and more criminals are getting out, they're going- Russian to, cowboys. Yeah, they're starting to work for those folks. Then the government is like going bankrupt. So they're selling off key assets that they have. And who has money? It's these bootleggers. But if you start throwing money around and buying more assets, you need to create protection around your assets, right? So that is where all these former criminals end up linking up with these guys and sort of like that starts building out these different yeah, Russian no mafia thief factions. left behind, dude. Yeah, dude, exactly. Yeah, right? yeah. Listen, they're entrepreneurs. You know, they've got a skill set. Yeah. These guys are looking to hire. They know what they're good at and they're sticking to it. Okay, so then from 1988 to 1991, the Soviet Union collapses and it's a free-for-all with the private, what was called the privatization privatization, excuse me, of Russia, where the state is like selling off like everything to the highest bidder, basically. And that's where these kleptocrats, which is just basically like a thief, p politician, gangster, they just start moving in and just taking over major industries in Russia. And again, yeah, it seems like they should have saw that one coming. Yeah, <laughs> right. You would have thought, right. And this is like the heyday of the Russian mafia folks, because now they're making real money. They're taking over major parts of the government. And it's like a common thing. People kind of say that the Russians still before cameras, still before things. Yeah, right? dude. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they can do it. Right. But also what's happening is people talk a lot about how the Russian government is effectively run by gangsters. And this is really what it is, is there's just a complete blending of the Russian government and the Russian mafia because they're so in bed with each other, even in um, 1999, um, President Yeslin, who was basically the precursor to Putin, he says that the Russian mafia state is the most powerful, like crime syndicate in the world. Like he's like announces it's out of control. What year was that? Um, uh, 99. He said that. And what was the quote? I didn't write the quote down exactly, but he was basically oh. saying that like the mafia state in Russia was more powerful than even like the government at that point. Oh, he should have been known that. Yeah, right. <laughs> I thought he was saying it was like worse than anywhere else. But like, at this point, it was like out of control. Like there wasn't, um, he, basically he was saying he couldn't manage them. It was too much. Like because, you know, it was getting out of control. So then Putin comes in and Putin was able to control the gangsters. Like he had come up in like a rough part of Russia. He knew a lot of those guys. He was a former KGB agent. And a lot of those guys ended up like working together too. So he was the real deal. They were like, all right, yeah, this guy will keep it in check. 
A thing that's interesting is that just to kind of lay some context into how closely the government was kind of controlled by the Russian mafia, it's estimated that around three hundred billion dollars a year in bribes, three hundred billion with a B, okay. is paid out <laughs> by the Russian mafia to government officials. Three hundred billion. Wow. Yeah, it's an estimated figure from one of the crime websites. Um, oh my like God. That. Yeah. <laughs> right? That's so. Why not just overtake? Well, it, they basically did, dude. I mean, it's think about yeah, it. It's I like guess, it's yeah, like yeah, when people yeah. talk about how like the mobs ran the unions. Same thing. It's like, well, they did. They just didn't need to be president because they're right. You know, does that make sense? Right, yeah. right. And that's right. why people say like, oh, the Russian government is just a criminal state. That's so wild. Yeah. And I will say, I've had friends who um, like grew up in like former USSR when they were real little, you know, before it collapsed, and they were like, yeah, it was like that. Like they're like it was just it's not at all like that's why every Russian American thinks they can just pay off anyone cut yeah. the line get that's get that's how it to, works over there yeah, yeah it's yeah. not just Russia my dad went to China a few years ago with my mom like tour around and whatever and he had a he had a like a fr family friend of a friend that was his tour guide and he asked my dad like what do you do and my dad has a, uh, he's retired now but he had a job with the government and he was like oh and like he thought he was like <laughs> yeah, yeah, some yeah. guy rolling in it because he was taking bribes my dad's like no i'm like a civil servant man <laughs> and the guy's like okay sure <laughs> yeah, sure like yeah, yeah. it didn't comprehend to him because he just thinks like american who works for the government who had enough money to visit china he must be like some big way you know it's just you know what a different culture over there you know yeah anyway back to the russians okay Wrong they are so then we kind of start entering the window where there's a little bit more kind of top-down, you know, organization and of the these because at this point it's just criminal outfits. There isn't really a lot of like specific identity to like we're from this group, we're from that group. They're just known as like thieves in the law. That's sort of the phraseology they use for okay. themselves. Okay, but in the late '80s, as um, you know, the Soviet Union is collapsing. This guy named Sergei Mikhailoviv. I think is his name. His nickname is like Mikas or Miha, something like that. He becomes like the top dog and creates the Solens Sveskaya Bratva, I think is how you say it. Um, it's from, you know, the area of Russia they come from. So okay. when you say like Bratva, a lot of times you think like, oh, that mafia. Same when people say like the mafia, typically they mean the Italian American mafia in the right. United States, right? Right, right, right. Um, so, but they're like the main Bratva. Um, this this dude, Sergey, by the way, he was a waiter before he did all this. He was a waiter and then went to prison for fraud. And then when he got out, he sort of had the ingenuity to start this, like, wing of Bratva. Okay, now, we, we're going to pause on the Russian Russian mafia. Doesn't that make you worried about every waiter you've ever had? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, they're all just waiting in the cut. Yeah, <laughs> like, dude. Well, it just shows, like, he didn't even have to come from, like, a super rough. I mean, anyway, he could have, maybe he did come from a rough background. But it's like, he wasn't, like... A criminal entrepreneur from the start. He was like a guy right. slinging dishes, and he's like, "No, no, no, I can do this better." Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna pause dishes on to uranium, baby. <laughs> there you go, dude. Russian, Russian uh, mafia. Now we're gonna go to American Russian mafia and how that started. Okay. okay? So in the '70s and '80s, waves of Russians, when when um, they started to like loosen the restrictions on who could leave Russia, waves of them are coming into the U.S. Well, that in the Rocky movies, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of them are settling up in <clears throat> Brighton Beach in Brooklyn. Okay. Sure. And again, when they get to the U.S., a lot of them like most immigrants, have a tough time. They don't speak the language. They're not getting jobs super easily. But also, from the culture that they knew, they knew how to be tricksters and thieves because that was the culture of Russia, okay? Um, so in the beginning, a lot it was very common for them to do schemes. Like, there was some, this is a real thing that they did. It was called the potato bag scheme. And they would just fill a bag with potatoes and trick another immigrant into thinking it was a bag of gold or jewels. I don't know how they pulled this off. I would you would think they would check the bag, <laughs> but it was like real like cartoony low level that stuff. That seems more like they just had a bag of potatoes and like walked up on a guy and they're like, "You want to buy these jewels?" Yeah, I like, just made him take the money. That's kind of how it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know, but anyway, so just classic bullying. The height of this, really, as we like um, continue with the immigrants coming in to New York, you know, they're coming in, in the 70s, the 80s. By the early 90s, that was where we hit like the golden age of like Russian mafia in the United States. In fact, 
the FBI, looking back, has said that in the 90s, the Russian mafia was the number one threat to national security. Yeah, that makes sense. I feel like because I feel like the 90s is kind of when the Italian American mob died out. So we're going to get right. to that in a little bit. Okay. So even though there's all these different sort of criminal elements in the Russian mafia in America, there isn't like an organized leader. But then this guy named, again, another one of these names, <laughs> Vyacheslav Ivankov, I think is how you say his name. Um, <laughs> his nickname was Yap Yapnochik. Peter which literally translates to little Japanese. And he wasn't Japanese. He just has, he's full Russian. He just has small <laughs> eyes. So even though they would let anybody in the Russian mafia, they weren't like so progressive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're just like, you look Asian. And like, that was his nickname, you know? Little Japanese. That was his nickname. What is he, a rapper? Like that? <laughs> <laughs> That's fucking... <laughs> um, but this guy comes in and he's like, hey, Worst we're going to organize ever. and make this like a real thing. He starts, he's one of the first people, there's a few, but he's one of the first guys that kind of starts building pipelines, to the American Italian mafia, the cartels, and sees that like, hey, we're going to make a structure here to organize this thing. So very similar to La Cosa Nostra, at the top, you have what's called the Pacan or the Papa, the Godfather. It literally yeah. means Papa, but it's like the Godfather, right? Then below that, there are two, they're uh, basically the term they used they're a combination of spies and bookkeepers. The term, and I'll get to that in a second. Okay, that's called Ders Hetzel Obshika. I don't know, man, these words are really fucking hard, dude. Um, but basically. No, 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 no. The difference of being a spy and a bookkeeper is so, so vast <laughs> <laughs> to think that one day you could just be doing spy work and then the next day you're doing the fucking. But. But so the bookkeeping is really more about keeping track of the bribes and also, yeah, yeah. right. But here's the thing. Keep in mind, where do they come from? They came from communism where yeah. it was a network of people ratting on each other and bribing the government. So, of course, they're thinking of like, how are we going to organize our political structure, the gang? We're going to have that two of those guys. So they're one's kind of watching the other at the same time to pay, like right under the papa. You know what I'm saying? Right. It does seem funny. But when you think about where they came from. Well, no, like I, I get it, but it just seems like you could have spies and then you could have bookkeepers. Right. Like, like it doesn't just to, to think the job was, hey, you're <laughs> you're going to you're going to go find out information and then you're going to do some math. For I know us. it's hilarious. It's so fucking wild. And it's funny that there were specifically two. Like with if I remember correctly in the Cosa Nostra, there's like one consigliere. Is that the term? I think. Yeah. Right. Like a, like his number two. Um, anyway, so under. Those two two guys. Um, there's what's called brigadiers. The Russian word is avtoriat, or it literally means authority. They're like the capos, basically. Yeah. And the capos usually had a group of five to six men who were known as the bratok, the soldiers. They kind of do that. And then for their associates, they used a word called shestoyoka, I think is how you say it, which basically means interns. That's like the full – like that's the they're, translation. They're bitch boys. But here's the part that was really interesting is the associates like – compared to the American mafia, if you were an associate, you were an associate. You, you're, not, you're never going to be a made man. That's where you stay. But because they didn't have those rules for the Russian mafia, it was designed to be temporary. So either basically you would be an associate and they would bring you in, or it was like, okay, we tried you, get out of here. It wasn't really, you didn't float in that window too much. Go to the Polish mafia, you piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but back to our p point earlier, uh, they actually did use the Polish a lot. We'll get to that in a little bit. Who didn't? Uh, um, <laughs> in New York, they had the Odessa Mafia, was what it was known as. Okay. Because um, it was from Odessa, Russia, is the part they a lot of them came from. And they settled in Brooklyn. In Los Angeles, actually, their main people they work with is Armenian Power. Yeah, dude. Which is the Armenian gang. Yeah. yeah. And then bunch of bitch boys. Yeah. They're, well, yeah. <laughs> Just a bunch you're of Armenian, people. too, so I'll let you say yeah, it. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would be wild if I wasn't. If you were in Armenian Power... No, the, no, if I was an Armenian and I was like, yeah, they're a bunch of bitch boys. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, not that many. Apparently, there's only 250 of those guys in total. They were, yeah. found, they were founded in 89. Basically, yeah, same thing. There's like 3 million Armenians in the world. How many, yeah. how many gangsters can they <laughs> really good, have, dude? That's a good point, dude. Yeah. Um, the term for being a made man is vor literally means thief. 
So again, it's just, we're so like, we, you're a thief. Like it's almost like a code of honor to be a thief, right? Like that's the terminology they used. It's just like so unoriginal. What, just saying, you, call, like we're yeah, a thief? Yeah, 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 just like they already took the thief thing. Like make it, I don't know. Yeah. Just, no, uh, well, I think it's that's like the weed being like, be creative, man. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. I think you're right. I mean, I think, but it's also like because it was a, it was their way of protesting under a dictatorship. Yeah. You know, so I think it was a little yeah. more pride there. Um, okay, but then here's one of the key yeah. guys who really started to bring everything together with the Italians and the Russians. Okay, his name was Marat Bala, Balagula, I believe. He was actually a Russian Jewish immigrant who came over mm. and he owned 14 gas stations. And, you know, just the business he got into. Classic. Okay. Then he started getting close with the Lucchese and Colombo families. Sure. And he realized together they could make a killing on using gas stations to commit, to commit tax fraud. Have you heard about this? What happened? And this is like kind of a famous uh, like crime story. So the short of it is. Basically, this guy, uh, Marat Balagula, again, he figured out how to set up all these different shell companies and, like, move the money around where it couldn't be traced. And kind of, like, same thing, how you'll speak for the Armenians. I will say, as a Jewish person, I'm not, like, so deep in it, but it's my culture for sure. It is, like, kind of on the nose that the Jewish guy was like, okay, we're going to hide the money. Yeah. We're going to figure <laughs> out, how, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's his in with the Italians. It's like, I'm going to make the finances work yeah. here. Trust me, you know? For sure. Um, this guy was a motherfucking badass, though. I'll get to that in a little bit. But it's just funny that, like, that was his thing. So, basically what would happen was he would set up one company, and they would sell gas to another company, and then sell the gas to another company, and then it would end at, like, a P.O. box, and there was never any taxes being paid on it. And then by the time the IRS and the government investigated, the company it, like, landed on that was supposed to um, be paying the taxes didn't even exist. And he was able to just make it where it was so <laughs> almost impossible to track anyone. It's a magic trick. Um, I mean, made well over $40 million for the mob. So enough where they're like, okay, yeah, this guy. Got nothing on their government, though. Fucking th $300 billion, $40 oh, million, yeah, sure. you know what I mean? <laughs> but it was, enough, it was enough to, like, pique the interest of the Lucchese's. Um, yeah, I guess that's one scheme. Right. One, one scheme. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Right, right, right. Sure. Um, okay, so um, this guy also... Uh, had an enforcer named Boris Neyfeld, and this dude... Boris is an enforcer name. Yeah. No, Boris is like a pretty classic Russian name. Okay. But this, yeah. It's <laughs> is that not, like it's, Bill for them? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Right. But this dude, like, if you if you Google this guy, he is like a badass. Like, he's like old, like he's old now, but like, just like bald head, big tats, like scary as fuck Russian dude. I saw there's a documentary on National Geographic, and they would ask him like, hey, how did you like, you know run your like enforcement rackets and he would say like in broken russian he'd be like or in broken english with a russian accent he'd be like i take gun i put on head i tell them you not pay me i kill you they pay me it was like <laughs> the most russian you know just keep it simple keep, yeah. you know keep it simple stupid okay so yeah exactly That's so um balagula that guy from russia he's in with the lucchese's he's making the lucchese's a lot of money and then the Columbos see that, like, hey, we could, like, shake this guy down. So they go and they try and mess with his subordinates and really, you know, um, ra uh, rattle them. So Balagula, uh, Balagula goes to the Lucchese's and he's like, hey, they're messing with me. Like, what do I do here? Then the Lucchese's basically put out to the other families, like, if you touch them, you got a problem with us. And that sort of really brought them in to, like, major, um, you know, mob power. And this dude, just to show you how eccentric he was, uh, he had a pink marble mansion in New York City, and he had a private island off the coast of Africa. It was near a mine. So the gas thing was sort of his introduction. Then he's in with the gas, and he's like, I can open up other pipelines for us. He figured out how to get... Africa. First talking, you know? Yeah, right. Um, he also was a key player in opening the drug routes for the mafia to start selling heroin. Because for a while, the mafia didn't want to touch drugs. And then they saw how much money there was to be made. And so the, he was like, hey, I can get you a great connect to get the heroin here without getting caught. Because most of the heroin was coming directly from Asia. But what he did was, because he came from Russia, he knew that he could run it through Poland and it wouldn't be caught as easily. So he basically had Thai heroin you know, uh, operatives there 
get the heroin into Singapore. I knew the Polish would come back. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get the heroin into Singapore. In Singapore, they hide the, the heroin in televisions. They're getting shipped to the West. The televisions get stopped over in Poland for some bullshit reason, right? And then it looks like the TVs are coming from Poland, not from Singapore or Thailand. So it threw uh. off the authorities, and for a long time, they were never able to catch the Russian mafia doing that because they didn't know to look for the Polish. And the other thing, they had a really, really hard time infiltrating. The unsuspecting Polish. Yeah, right? dude. The, the police in America was because, like, there were Italian-Americans who could sort of, like, you know, Donnie Brasco, you know that story? Yeah. They could kind of blend in and slip in. It, you, it was like a closed community. Very few people spoke Russian who weren't direct immigrants. And because of the culture of not trusting the government, it was like impossible to get American Russian immigrants to work with the authorities. So they really had a a long time. And that was what kind of did it is that um, Michael Franzese, do you know him? He was a capo in the Colombo family. He's all over like YouTube now. He's he did 10 years for racketeering and tax conspiracy. But now, now he's, he's a YouTube star. He really is. He made himself into a celebrity. Headlining like, Caroline's <laughs> next weekend. <laughs> but these guys, he's he's the real deal. He's not, like he's really interesting. And he was a capo. He wasn't just like some like associate like Henry Hill. So uh, he right. re- so he actually does speak with like authority of like this is true. This is bullshit. I did see an interview that he says a lot of Goodfellas is bullshit. Yeah, I mean, I think you get that sense when uh, what's his name Hill at the end of his life just like kept trying to get in the spotlight right and it was like of oh this well he said henry hill was like a nobody he was like a right. guy who would hang around they would use him here and there he wasn't this like big operative that they made him seem like and you know again it's hollywood hollywood right. is fake shocker but yeah of course henry hill's like you know but he's one of the only guys who's actually from the higher ups of that world that is like gone and talked about like this you know how it works how it doesn't work but he said that, like, yeah, the Russian mafia now is way more powerful than the Italian mafia. Oh, yeah. Like, today, not even close. There's one other guy I'll talk about. And this guy's name, um, Semen, Semen? Simon? I don't know. I'm sorry, guys. Simon Yudkovich Mogolgovich, I think is his name. And he kind of became, like, the first boss of all bosses of the American mafia. And, like, really helped solidify, like, making, like that full top-down structure. Only because everybody had such a hard time pronouncing his name <laughs> that he became top fucking dog. Yeah, he was really close with the Genovese family, but he also was really powerful because he owned a company that basically controlled the gas between Russia and Ukraine. So this guy had, like, crazy money. He have This last thing I'll share, I just think it's so funny. He eventually got arrested. Oh, no, excuse me, he didn't get arrested, but he ended up on the FBI's most wanted list He's still alive. He's actually living in Russia. Um, but they took him off the top because they can't extradite him from Russia. But when he was in America and on the lam, they were trying to catch him. So these are all the charges okay. the FBI leveled against him. He's still wanted. Like, if he comes back to America, he's fucked. Yeah. But he was hit with wire fraud, mail fraud, racketeering, money laundering, arms trafficking, drug trafficking, human trafficking, aiding and abetting, murder, smuggling, prostitution, securities fraud, and financial fraud. And that was all before the end of the fiscal quarter. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, – that's a good stack. Yeah. I feel like you can uh, – like, it's funny, though, because, like, he's in Russia, so they're like, we can just put all of that on him. Right, yeah. And then we don't have to be like, ah, we didn't catch the guy. You know what I mean? Well, Russia was like, we don't care. Yeah, why would they? Yeah. Dude, that's the Russian mafia, dude. That's so wild. What do you think? I think I like the old Russian mafia and the gulags better than I like the ones over here. The ones over here are just you don't you don't have to do that, right? right you yeah. know what I mean? But like the ones in the gulag, they had something to fight for. Yeah, and then you know, but it's, it's still so that's partly why it's so complicated and even now in Russia because the guys who kind of took over all the industries were gang leaders, and it's just how it is. So. Which is so funny because gang leaders out here that get management positions are fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you ever work for one of them Dude, no. on a construction crew? They oh, don't yeah. give a shit, bro. I've definitely had bosses that were criminals. I don't know, but like not, not like, or like they weren't like authority figures. They were just, they were just bad people, you know? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah I sure. did. I will say I did work at this car wash in high school. And, oh, I have one summer break where I worked at a car wash, and I'm almost positive the manager was selling weed out of the car wash because <laughs> I heard, like, rumors. Yeah, he had to eat. Makes sense, but I heard rumors that, like, people – and it's a pretty good scheme. 
they would come in and like do the order and they would add like some upgrade, right? And so that so he's like detailing the car. And then while he's like detailing the car, he would like put the weed in the car and then they would give him like a like the money when they're paying him out. <laughs> Yeah, man, get 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 an eighth and a fucking wash. That dude. could have also been one of my coworkers talking shit. I don't really yeah. know, <laughs> and I never, I didn't want to investigate too closely because I didn't know the manager like that, and I didn't want to like honestly fucking stop snitching. That person would have never <laughs> made it in the Russian mob. Yeah, they would have got fucked. Don't snitch. But also, it's it's weed, dude. Like if you're, who cares? Yeah. Like you know, yeah, good for yeah, him yeah. for. I, I do agree with uh, uh, the thievery thing. Like if it, like as far as like thieves help thieves, dude. We're, yeah. all, we're all working at a fucking car wash. Shut up. Well, I think it's interesting, too. Like, these guys, just the, how it evolves, right? Like, they come over to the U.S. and they're just like, hey, we're just going to try and survive, do, like, petty crime. And then a couple of these guys come in and they're, like, looking at, like, well, who are the, like, real shot collar criminals? Oh, it's these, these Italian dudes. It's like, well, we need to get him with them. And so he, like, came to them with this idea, like, hey, we can make all make a lot of money together if we get yeah. out on this scheme. And then over time... The Italian mafia kind of went like this, and the American mafia kind of rose up. But another thing that's interesting, excuse me, the, the Russian mafia. Did I say Russian mafia? Yeah. Yeah. No, you didn't, but I knew what yeah, you meant. Yeah, right. Is that like some of the, like the, um, that guy who's uh, the YouTube star from the uh, Columbus or who, Michael Francisi, whatever his name is, he says like a big reason it's declined for the Italians is, is two things. One, a lot of guys don't have to do that. And they saw enough years of people like getting snitched on and thrown in prison for a long time yeah. and dying. And, and it, they weren't like Italians weren't persecuted like they used to be. But another thing is like technology just got to the, the things that they well, yeah. made their bones doing. You couldn't do anymore. Like exactly. you couldn't, you can't do a protection racket. That, and that's what I meant earlier. Yeah. I did, we, you were saying something about somebody in the 80s, and I was like, yeah, it was before, like, cameras. And I right. obviously yeah. I know cameras were a thing, but, like, that's before you got caught. You were literally – we were filmed constantly. And yeah, dude. With so many tracers on you at all points in time, whether it's your watch or your phone or your, like, your fucking – It would be impossible to do earbuds. Hits. You know, yeah. no. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people still do it, I guess they figure it out. But like the st the way they used to do it, they always get. Caught. But apparently, apparently they are still active. It's just not like they used to be, according to this guy. Um, what well, does active mean? They go they play some bocce, they no dude. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't know. Like, yeah, they're money laundering. Fine. Yeah. But also we, that's the episode I did this morning was on money laundering. Mm. Yeah. And we talked about that a lot, too. A lot of crossover. But, uh, yeah, dude, man, thanks for coming on, man. Thanks this for having great. me, dude. Um, remind everybody where they can, like, see you, support you, all that stuff. Uh, you can follow me at Ant Amarello, A-N-T -A period A-M-O-R-E-L-L-O, -L -L on Instagram. That's where I post my shows. That's where you can find out where I'll be. Uh, I'm going to be on the East Coast for, like, three weeks. I'm not sure of my dates where, but I know I am doing some shows, so definitely check it out. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Dude, I love it, man. All right, guys, so I've been your host, Alex Getlin. We will see you next time.